Hi, I'm Jimmy. In this video, we're analyzing Traveler stock, ticker symbol TRV. So this video is part of our Dow 30 series, where we're analyzing all 30 companies in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Now, one of the things we're gonna try to do with this is once we're done analyzing, then we're gonna try to pick which ones look like the best value stocks, the best growth stocks, the best dividend stocks, something along those lines. So if you have any votes for which, why, which companies look the best so far, please let, let us know down in the comments below. Okay, now let's jump into their revenue. So this is a pie chart that breaks down their revenue. We can see that most of the revenue, according to the most, most recent fiscal year, most of the revenue is generated from their business insurance division. They also have their personal insurance division. And when we look at their revenue history going back the past 15 or 18 years, what we could see recently, revenues ramped up a decent amount. But to make sure we understand how revenue is generated for a company like Travelers Insurance, well, let's break down their fiscal year 2022 revenue. So their biggest revenue contributor is what they call earned premiums. And basically the way an insurance business works is that if we personally want, let's say I want car insurance. Well, I go and I pay them a premium. I pay them my monthly payment. Well, if I pay for the whole year, they haven't earned it. The reason they call this earned premiums is they earn as much as time has passed. So if I pay for the whole year, every month that goes by, they account for one month of that as revenue. If I pay monthly, well, they account for it as it comes in. That is one way that they generate revenue. Then another way that they generate revenue is through something called a net investment income. We can see that this is the orange section here. Net investment income is they take all that earned premiums, all the revenue that they brought in, even their unearned premiums, they take all of that premium money, they invest it. Well, let's say they invest it in a whole bunch of bonds. They invest primarily in bonds. Well, those bonds pay interest. That interest is money that they get to put into revenue, put into profit. That money, that the revenue that they earn from their investments falls under net investment income. Now, in the case of travelers, they actually have smaller proportional net investment income compared to some companies, a company like uh, Berkshire Hathaway, which makes significantly more money from net investment income. Okay, then the next category that goes on top of this one is something called fee income. So they have a whole bunch of offices around the world. They have a whole bunch of services that they offer, and some of those services charge fees. This category is exactly what it sounds like. It is the fee income that they generate from some of the services that they have. Not necessarily tied to the insurance, but certainly tied to some service that they're offering that, is, that a fee is generated for. Then their final category is what they classify as other. This is really a catch-all phrase. This could be a whole ton of things that could fall under reinsurance, Reinsurance is when the insurance company gets insurance themselves, just in case there's a, you know, a big, you know, a big hurricane that wipes out a whole area that they have to replace everybody's car. Well, they might have reinsurance to protect them against that type of thing. So any revenue that could be generated over there, well, they put it all into the catch-all phrase other. Okay, so now we have a basic idea of how they generate revenue, but now let's look at something that's a bit more specific to the insurance industry. And ultimately, we're going to build up to the combined ratio. But in order to get there, we're going to start with the expense ratio. So this is traveler's expense ratio going back to 2009. And we can see this is about 30%. Now, if we're curious, the expense ratio is how much, what are the expenses to run the business? So they have a whole bunch of offices around the country, by the way, 95% or so of their, the revenue that they generate is generated in the United States and in Canada. The other 5% is international. But those locations that they have generate expenses. Those expenses go into the expense ratio. So out of the revenue that they generate, about 30%, give or take, but it's been, we could see, fairly consistent, even to slightly down over the past few years, about 30% is tied up in expenses. Then the next ratio that gets added to this ratio is the loss ratio. And basically what the loss ratio is, is what claims have been filed to the insurance company. So again, I going back to my car example, I get in an accident and now I need to file a claim. Well, I file a claim and they pay out that claim to me. This loss ratio we can see represents 
about 60, 65% of the hundred. But the ratio is how much, what percentage of total revenue or total earned premiums are accounted for, uh, are, are paid out that year, essentially. So this is important because these two, when you add these two up, well, these become the combined ratio. Many times we'll look at an insurance business and we quickly look at the combined ratio. The most important level here is 100. Anything below 100 is profitable. Anytime the number goes above 100, it is a ne it is negative. It's a not profitable year. So if they pay out more than 100% of the revenue that they're bringing in, the combined ratio would be above 100. Now that could, it doesn't mean that the company is necessarily a bad business. The reason that this ratio is a good quick gauge to look at is let's pretend that there was a bad storm that wiped out a whole bunch of cars for travelers. So they had to pay out a whole bunch of money that year and they didn't have reinsurance. So their, their loss ratio goes way up that year. Well, the loss ratio goes way up. They end up losing money, but the following year, you, oftentimes you'll have a pullback in it. So what we're looking for from an analysis perspective is we're looking for consistency. We can see over the past decade or so, they've been fairly consistent in about the mid 90s range, which explains why they have smaller profit margins relative to, relative to many businesses, many industries out there. Okay, so now that we've looked at these core insurance ratios, let's go to some more baseline business ratios in general. First up is return on invested capital. Now, basically what return on invested capital is, is it measures how efficiently a company uses the capital that they have. We can see when we're looking at travelers, well, since 2008, they have gradually gotten, broadly speaking, more efficient with, their, with investing their capital, which is a very good thing. Okay, next up, we've got the average shares outstanding. So in the financial reports going back each year, yeah, I know, we went all the way back to 2006, they tell you how many shares outstanding on average they have for that company throughout that year. This gives us a good idea as to whether or not the company's been buying back shares. We can see the trend here is clearly much lower. So they have done a good job of consistently buying back shares, which tends to be a good thing for investors. Along those same lines, we have dividends. Basically, how much are they paying in dividends per share? Once again, the green lines, by the way, are analyst estimates for dividends going out the next couple of years, but we can see the growth rate for dividends has been really strong. So if dividends are something that we like, traveler's insurance seems to be quite good. Okay, now let's jump in and try to come up with a fair value for traveler stock. So insurance companies are a little bit different. So using discounted free cash flow isn't really the best valuation method for this type of company. Instead, we're using price to book value. And basically we look at what the price to book value was over the past five years. The green line, that the darker green line that sort of flows along with it is the rolling five-year average. And in theory, we wanna pay below the five-year average. Right now, you can see that the current price to book value for this company is way higher than the five-year average. So right now it appears that travel stock is a bit overvalued. So as far as when we consider the companies in our Dow 30 analysis that could make for good value stocks, at this moment, Travelers is not one of them. Where they could fall into the interesting investment perspective, uh, they could fall in there for dividends. Right now, we saw how much their dividends have ramped up. So this could be a really good dividend investment for long-term investors. Now, price to book value is actually one of the many new features that we're looking to roll out on our valuation website that is part of our online community where we're doing different live streams, things like that. So if you'd like to join to get access to the live streams, get access to the calculations as they gradually come live, I will leave the link for that in the description below. And thank you so much for sticking with me all the way to the end of the video. I really do appreciate it. Thank you and I'll see you in the next video.